I understand it was it was scheduled for much later in the year and they asked you to bring board. Can you talk a bit, a bit about in for you? So we uh, obviously we, we finished shooting uh, just before Christmas um, and we were uh, so we our post-production was going on as normal and we managed to get all of the pictures locked um, as was our original plan. Um, uh, but it was only after we'd, um, uh, we had managed to do the mixes on, on the first two episodes and, that, and then the lockdown came in. Um, so um, because we were, we were working in Scotland, uh, as we were part funded, we had some, some funding from Creative Scotland, uh, we were spending most of our money in, in Glasgow, so we were working with Glasgow companies and obviously when the, I was traveling every week up there, but obviously when the lockdown began, that had to stop. Um, and after that, uh, we've, we had to work remotely and, and the people up there who then couldn't even go into their workplaces, so for example, the sound mixer couldn't go into his studio, had to work out how they were, they were gonna manage. And, and they did an extraordinary job of dismantling uh, a studio and pretty much rebuilding it in a, in a garden shed. Um, so, and, and apart from that, we, we also had to do grades remotely, the same kind of thing. I think our grader was the only person traveling into their offices in central Glasgow and working alone, and then sending us stuff to look at remotely. It's not something we've ever done before, and under normal circumstances, I don't think you'd want to do it, but, but we made it work, and um, they were, they've all been extraordinary, incredibly inventive, and um, fantastic, really. So we delivered um, episode five on Friday, and it went out last night. That's how close it was. Um, I've never done anything as close as that before. And we were watching it last night on tender hooks just in case anything went wrong, but it, you know, it didn't. So everybody worked incredibly hard. So just, you know, for the future, there is a possibility of working more like this, which is one of the positive things that we're discovering. Um, our composer was in LA, our director was in Oslo, our dubbing mixer was in a shed in Glasgow, and we are in London. So, um, and then we had the assistant editor in London, um, you know, doing it remotely from his house. So it, it, it is possible, but it's, it's a bit frightening. And also the detail, we're never sure we can get the same detail, you know. Yeah. There's a couple of, um, yeah, there's a comment which I agree about. Locations, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. People saying it's lovely to see Scotland, but, and that, the, their house was stunning. And it is really beautiful. It's, I mean, it is fantastic, this push to see drama shot, shot in the regions like that and to really see locations you haven't seen before. Was that something that was a big part of what you wanted to do, was to show Glasgow in a different way? Oh, yeah, for sure. We, um, we, we decided from the beginning that we wanted to make Glasgow look as beautiful as we could make it. It's a very, very handsome city. It, 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 you'll find it often doubles for New York uh, in the movie world. And you can see, you know, it's, 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 it's actually the original city centre is built on, on the same grid system as New York. It's a very handsome city and maybe, maybe I don't want to down tag it here, but maybe it's got a bit of a reputation for being grimmer than it really is. The, um, the, the, the house at Cove, um, Nicole had simply written that they lived in a beautiful house by the sea. And uh, it just happened that, you know, location managers always have locations up their sleeves somewhere in their files, you know, places that they always want to use on a show sometime. And that, that we were just taken there very, very early and just said, it's amazing, let's, let's have it. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. I mean, yeah, I... Uh... Um, okay, yeah, wonderful. No spoilers, I agree. I haven't seen it because I was busy watching some of your other stuff last night. So absolutely, there will be no spoilers, everyone. Don't worry for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, uh, so a question about, we'll just, we'll just take one, one question and then we'll move on, which was, um, what, which crew professions can work remotely? I mean, we've, you know, I do factual and we're working quite successfully with editing. Um, uh yeah i mean they're you know certainly research certain things archive research you can see but there comes a point where you have to interact what what do you think the limitations are i mean certainly in your world you there comes a point where you have to go out shooting again well Ph philippa lothorpe you know who we'll talk about later who's a director who works a lot she's just done something for hbo and um she's editing from her from home now um 
Um, so it is possible. I mean, there's nothing that beats that connection of being in a room with a group of creative people. It's so exciting and that conversation is so exciting. But we're getting a bit better at it because we have to. Um, but obviously you can't shoot remotely. So, you know, when you, can't, you can't film it unless you're there. Um, so, you know. I think basically you could you can probably do the, the elements of, of post production, but it's it's not ideal. I mean, you know, in, in really you you all want to be in the same room together. But I think we've shown that it's it's not impossible. Yeah, and of course the massive thing that you can do is development. You know, uh, particularly for dramas now, which takes so long anyway. You know, I mean, so you can you can really spend this time to think about ideas and future projects and or working with writers that you're already working with so that's what most of us in the industries you know who are lucky enough to be employed within a company because of course there's so many freelancers who who, who aren't employed at the moment and that's really disastrous but if you're lucky enough to still be in a company um then we're all working flat out on development yeah great okay um so the, the structure of this for um, the 199 people out there uh, who've joined us is basically, it's creating factual drama. So we thought we'd, we'd talk a little bit about early career and then look at how they took, they took uh, three real life stories, uh, No Child of Mine, Five Daughters, and then The C Word, and turned those stories in, into drama. And uh, talk a bit about duty of care, you, you you need to kind of go through this process so but first of all I, everyone always wants to know is how ooh, uh, how could how did you get going how did you start what was your everyone has a lucky break did you have a lucky break or were you just you, you know i don't know what happened simon uh, uh well uh, my first job was in um well, bloody hell! The kind of early eighties was uh, I. Um, I got a, hol a holiday re holiday relief job at the BBC, and in um, in those days, the drama department was split into plays and series and serials. And I got a, a six week holiday relief job in uh, what was called the plays department, uh, and they just kept they they kept renewing my contract. That's how I started. Um, it was just the tail end of play for today. I think I actually worked on one play for today, and then. That yeah, stopped. Yeah. And then eventually plays was, nobody makes plays in that sense anymore, but that's where I began. So uh, my, my, my journey was really different because I came from the theatre. Well, I went to drama school and I was going to be an actress and then I realised I wasn't going to be very good as an actress. So then I wanted to direct, so then I directed in the theatre um, for a good few years and did drama in for uh, radio. Um, and then I had a bite of really serious illness when I was in, uh, 30 and, um, and I had to change everything kind of in my career. And I was lucky enough, uh, a very good friend of mine, Hilary Salmon, uh, we were doing a theatre company together at the time and she was working in television with Michael Waring and she said, oh, just come and read a few scripts and, you know, we'll get you back into the workplace and everything. And, I was terrified of television. I didn't want to come anywhere near television. I was really scared of it. So, um, and then gradually, you know, Michael was fantastic to work with and the, and the, the material that Michael was creating from that department was brilliant. Um, things like Boys from the Black Stuff, things like that. So, so and then I stayed in television and that, that, so that was my massive break and um, yeah. Any advice to, to you know, breaking into, into drama? I mean, is there, you know, compared to when you started to now, is it, do you think it's easier? Do you think it's, I mean, there's certainly a lot more money with the streamers um, in drama and in some ways we are never busier, although I know the Americans call us the white Mexicans because we're so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard this before, yes. <laughs> oh, um, you know, so yeah, so there's two questions there. Is do you think the landscape is better? And you know, what would be your advice to for people who want to get into drama as a as a kind of good route in? It's really difficult, isn't it? Because we are established, so we don't know how difficult it is to get in. I mean, the competition has always been ridiculous. So um, I'd say, you know. If you're passionate about it, really, really passionate about it, and you can build up your skills in any direction that you can, like we come from such different skill sets, 
um, you will get a break. You will get a break. You just got to knock on an awful lot of doors. You've got to, you know, this is awful, but sometimes you have to read and do things for free. But also there's so much out there that you can absorb and uh, that can help with your personal creativity. So that when you're really ready, when you're going in and you're talking to somebody and you're trying to convince them that you really are passionate about something and can do something, um, that, that they'll, they'll believe you and because you've got enough backup of enough knowledge because of things you've watched and analyzed yourself. But, but I'm coming at it from the development end, so that's my thing. Whereas with Simon on the production end, that's... Well, I, I, I would say now the industry is much more compartmentalized than when I started. So yeah. my advice would be, if you want to end up in a creative role, that is to say, uh, writing, directing, or producing, um, don't go in as a location manager. Uh, because it is very compartmentalized and I think if you go in in one of the the production grades it's actually very it's harder now to move across into the creative grades than it used to be uh, the only trouble with that of course is is those those creative jobs uh, for example script editing are, are that it's very competitive it's, they are hard to, they are hard to get into but there are a lot of production companies so as Sue says it's just a matter probably of knocking on a lot of doors and what what we're in need of the whole industry and uh, dramas in need of we need brilliant producers we don't we don't have enough producers i mean we just don't and um and that's going to get tougher and tougher and ha as the the industry has exploded you know with the svods and everything and there's more material being made uh, we need more producers so i would say that's a, because that's a you know that's both sides but of course you have to get there <laughs> so you've got to get to that place but that's a good ambition to have, I would think. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, let's let's move on. You've you, you you've kind of um, your reputation. I mean, you've done the most huge amount of drama, everything from Light Rise to Candleford or Paradise, very traditional costume, you know, soft BBC costume drama, to you know some incredibly hard hitting dramas based on real life stories. There's quite a lot of uh, questions coming through about. How, how do you know that a story is right for adaptation and how do you set about doing it? And perhaps we could talk about that in relation to No Child of Mine, which was your first drama for ITV. So if you could perhaps just precy the, the story for those that don't remember. I'm not sure I can uh, precy that far back, but it was, a, <laughs> it was, a, it was about a, a young girl who, who uh, had suffered quite extraordinary sexual abuse. Uh, at the hands of her, of her parents and and how then uh, as she was pushed through the care system the abuse continued it was a pretty horrific story really yeah so when we when we were working with that uh, with Peter Kuzminski and uh, Guy Hibbert who was the, the writer so that idea came to us through Peter um, and um, and then we we worked on it to, together but it was so tough and it was so hard hitting. I didn't really realize until we made that, that you could get a, that you could make that kind of program for telly. Um, so that was a huge eye opener for us. And, and in, but on, and, we learned an awful lot on, on some of it wasn't very good either. Yeah, <laughs> and, in, and in both instances, interestingly with that and also with three girls, we, uh, we didn't expect to get a large audience. No, not at all. Uh, and uh, we, um, with three girls, um, we, we used to go into meetings with Charlotte Moore, the BBC One commissioner at that time, and, and we'd leave the meeting saying, you know, we, we don't think a lot of people are going to watch this. And, and Charlotte always, to her credit, said, That's, it doesn't matter, it's important that we do it. And, you know, no one was more surprised than us in both instances, in all of the, those films that we've made, the factual dramas, A Child of Mine, Five Daughters, Three Girls, The Sea Word. By, by the number of people who, who came to watch them, we were shocked, really. We thought we were going to get much smaller audiences. But also, they become a talking point, you know, they become a massive talking point. Um, but just going back to the question about how you know if something's going to work or not, well, you don't, basically. So, um, I mean, when you're doing factual drama like, the, like, like that, there, there are so many parts of the process that you've got to go through before you get it onto the screen. And we learned an awful lot from doing um, No Child of Mine about that. But then we didn't do it for a very long time because it's also really hard work, it's really time consuming. 
and it can be quite traumatic. <laughs> so it was, I mean, doing that show was quite traumatic because in the end, um, the papers got hold of it and our rushes were impounded and it, you know, it was really difficult. So I would say that put us off for a while and we went back to the day job of doing lots and lots of, you know, populist drama. Um, but then I think then what happened with, with Five Daughters, which was our next one, is that we, we really knew we wanted to get back into this arena. And um, I'd seen a, a, on the news and, and in, in various other places where the audience was so appalled by that story, which was about the murder of five women in Ipswich. Um, and the media kept referring to them as prostitutes. And the public started to fight back against the news readers and say, they're not prostitutes, these are victims. And why are you calling them prostitutes? Because you know they were women who were victims and this is wrong headed. And we heard that and went, okay, that is something the public now are ready for a different telling of the story. And we want to try and find out what that story is. But it took us two years to get to the police and to get into those stories. And then Simon, um, you know, uh, uh, and then Philippa came on to, do, to direct it. Stephen Butchard wrote the most amazing scripts. Um, but then we had to get, you know, to the real people through the police. Um, I'm gonna hand that over to you because yeah, but the question was how you, the, you've gone off, you've gone off piece a bit oh, because <laughs> the question the question was more about that uh, happens a lot. How, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know if it's going to work? You don't know. The answer is you don't know. You have to be passionate, so passionate about the story that you want to tell that you'll do anything to get to the guts of the story. If you're really fascinated by something, then the chances are that lots of other people are going to be fascinated as well. And when we are working on these, when we tell people what we're doing and you get the jaw drop, I mean, that's usually a pretty good indication, isn't it? When somebody goes, oh, no, I didn't know that, you're, that's probably gonna work. It's as simple as that, <laughs> because people are fascinated by, and they don't believe what you're saying, yeah. uh, what you're telling them. So, I mean, both, I mean, you know, Five Daughters about the Ipswich um, murders and uh, No Child of Mine about the Rotherham um, sex abuse ring were incredibly high profile stories. But I think there's, so I think we'd all think, wow, yes, there's a, there's a kind of story to be told there. But the, the question is, is how do you do that? How, how do you, what is the, the, the step? Because obviously, there is a huge uh, duty of care. Well, first of all, you've got to get access and then all the way through, once you've, even from that first conversation, you have a duty of care to those victims and to, to their families. So can you talk a bit about how you, how, you, how you approach the victims in these cases? Because even that first phone call must feel so, is that the right word, prurient, whatever, it must feel incredibly intrusive, like approaching the, the mothers in Five Daughters or the, the victims themselves in Three Girls. Well, what we've done is we've always, we, because that access thing for people in drama is really tough, okay? Because we're not used to knocking on doors of real people and talking to them. Um, whereas documentary makers and people in factual are really, really used to that, to that and really good at it. So what we do, always has got have we gone through um more official people to start with so with uh, five dollars was the police and then with three girls it was a contact that um that simon had and with Maggie but, Oliver. But in, in both in both cases the introductions came through um uh what was in the police what are called flos family liaison mm -hmm. officers yeah uh, whenever there's a major crime like that the police assign a liaison officer who becomes who's a police officer who becomes very involved with the family, uh, almost living with them. And in both, both those cases, uh, once we had persuaded senior police officers that we were trustworthy or, suffi or sufficiently trustworthy, they uh, allowed uh, the family liaison officers to contact the families and ask them, and they could have said no, uh, if they wanted to talk to us. And um, it, obviously that's a very slow burn. In the case of um, three girls, um, I already knew 
uh, Maggie Oliver, uh, the, the police officer who, who we featured in, in the programme, Three Girls, uh, because uh, myself and Philippa Lothrop, the, the director, had been actually trying to do another story and, and um, we'd been introduced to her because she'd also been the family liaison officer in that story that we'd tried to do and we didn't get, we couldn't sell uh, that story, we couldn't find a, a buyer for it. So I already knew Maggie Oliver. And when then Sue and I were reading newspaper reports, a lot of what Andrew Norfolk wrote in the Times and started talking about that story, um, I was able to ring Maggie Oliver because I already knew her and ask her if she would be prepared to um, talk to us, tell us what she knew, and then possibly thereafter um, make some introductions for us. Um, and the thing to remember is they are only introductions. You, you then have to go into a room with the people and you know they, they obviously make a judgment on you if they think you're trustworthy and if they want to open their hearts to you. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very delicate business. Yeah. And of course with, with um, five daughters um, yeah. and three girls, um, because Philippa, Lothorp, who was a documentary maker. Um, so she was also yeah, used nice. to that. And, um, and then we learned an awful lot from Philippa, didn't we? And, and then she learned an awful lot from us because of the drama aspect. So it, this is all about skills coming together with different people with different skill sets. Um, you know, and then the process <laughs> after that is, is also very lengthy once because it never stops that duty of care once, once, once people have agreed that they'll talk to you and that they want to share their stories, um, then that's the beginning of a very long process with the, with the writer, with the director, um, with us, and then the scripts, and then us talking to them about the scripts and what's in the scripts, even before we film. And so, you know, three girls took about, well, it did, it did. It took four years to get to the screen. Um, so uh, the C word, not so long, because the C word was, based on a book, which, um, uh, which Lisa had written. So that was a bit quicker. Um, there's a question come through about how do, you, how do you assign a writer? How do you know which writer to put on which subject? How did you choose Guy? Why did you choose Nicole? What, what is it about, you know, once you've got, is it really early on that you work with the writer? Do you talk to the writer even before you make the approach? At what point do you bring the writer on and why? Why them? Um, I think you have to have the idea and I think you've got to and I think you have to have a, an in before approaching the writer because otherwise you don't have anything so um, and writers of drama will also be quite well not so much now but you know because there's, there's so much of it around now because there's so many true stories around but they can be quite frightened of taking on these kinds of subjects because of the responsibility um, but the writer that you'll find often, all of those people that we've worked with, um, have a, a huge compassion, you know, and, uh, um, and really, really want to tell those stories and be truthful to the stories that they're trying to tell. So being incredibly respectful um, of the people that, that, they're, that they're talking with, that those true stories. Now, obviously, when we get into creating the scripts, that's um, that's another thing because you've got to have a motor and you've got to have a structure and you've got to have all of those things and that's really that's quite difficult as well sometimes with timelines um, but I would say all of those people that we work with um, really closely those writers I mean Nicole we've done you know uh, this is our third thing we've done with her now that they, they they have a complete passion for telling that story but but from the contributors point of view and that's really really important because it's not about their ego it's about telling the story of the, the people who brought who are sharing their lives with us really. yeah there's another question coming which i think is a good one um what how, how do you navigate when you feel the need to add more fictional elements to heighten the drama or is that i mean presumably there's a um you conflate events to for or do you are you completely and utterly faithful to timelines to locations to everything or you know what you know where does the fact end and when does the fiction begin 
in in particularly with um let's talk about three daughters and uh no five daughters and three three girls getting them all mixed up because they're the most you know ones that people probably remember well um <laughs> the, the first thing is say for example in the case of five daughters not all of the families uh wanted their stories told uh so that from the beginning uh restricted what we could show and, and, and what we could do but but apart from that i think i mean the fundamental rule is really you can't mess around with the timeline because the minute you do that, then you know it's you're no longer telling the truth. And and the you know fundamentally, if you're going to do these true stories and you're going to um, you're going to ask for the trust of of people who've been traumatized by awful events, um, you don't want you, you know you you part of that the unwritten contract is that you you honor the truth. So you can't mess around with the you can't mess around with the, the the timeline at all, and you can't make stuff up. But 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 you have to do a bit of that. Um, you can't. I mean, the thing we find when you're creating the structure, uh, you do conflict events, and sometimes you conflict characters. So um, in Three Girls, for example. Um, the uh, social worker, Sarah Robotham, she wasn't a social worker, so the sexual health worker. Um, she was a, that character was a conflation of Sarah and a number of her colleagues, because when we talked to the colleagues, they didn't want to be um, in the films. They didn't want to, um, you know, to be personally name checked in the films. So we agreed with them that, that Sarah would become a kind of a, a conflation of a lot of those characters. And we do that a lot. Um, and as long as, but we always check with everybody that, that they're okay with that. And also the contributors need to understand that we can't, we're not going to be able to put in everything that they tell us, you know, and we're not going to be able to, we're going to cut quite a lot out and we're going to um, conflate uh, some of the things that happened to them. Maybe there's a couple of things they've told us or two or three things and we're going to conflate them into one scene. The scenes are not going to be exactly as they told us they happened or where they happened because the writer has to have the freedom to write the scenes um, and to make their own structure um, but everyone really understands that and also because in our process we share the scripts with them before we start to um, film and then we share the finished uh, uh, film with them um, before we finish the edit before uh before we lock the picture uh we show all the contributors the cut and we give them the right within reason they can't just say no to everything but but within reason to you know if they say we've got something wrong we would go back and change it and and in both those cases both those films uh in response to things that people said when we showed them the cuts uh we did go back and make changes yeah and and, and really major changes as well you know, in Five Daughters, we lost a whole storyline. Uh, and we did in Three Girls as well, actually, because they were very unhappy with, with, with it, with what we'd done. The thing is, though, when you get to that, it's such a difficult moment, that sharing what you've done with them. Um, but because of the trust that's been built up, so, you know, in our case, Simon does all of that work um, with them. Um, uh, and in both of those instances with Philippa and with Nicole. And because the trust is so strong, um, the contributors will trust what we're saying to them. And because we will take stuff out if it's really, if it's really, really upsetting anybody. Because what's the point? You know, we're telling a story about them, we're giving them their voice. If we end up really upsetting at the contributors who've given us so much of our time and energy and trying to give them the voice, then we've defeated the whole object <laughs> before we've even started, you know? Yeah, um, there's a question coming about. Do you, um, do you, do you, as a producer, do you purchase rights over these people's stories? Is it is it a formal agreement? Is yeah. it an access, an informal access? Well, what is the? Is there anything legal about your relationship? One that they sign. Um, they they all have to uh, sign releases, but we don't. No, we don't do anything. I mean, uh, for example, in the film world, if you if you want to do a biography, you would buy life rights to some famous person's uh, story. But in this case, that's a very fine line then, which we don't want to go near. 
uh, between, it's the kind of thing the tabloids would do. Uh, and, uh, you know, th there is, there's also a danger from our perspective that uh, if you do enter into some sort of a contract that somebody could, could you know, conflate a story that says, uh, well, you, you, know, you've, you've, you know, you've obviously paid them and therefore you're making stuff up. So we, we try to tread a very fine line where uh, there's, a, there's a sort of an un unspoken agreement, which is dangerous actually, because it means that at any point, potentially they could withdraw. Yeah. Uh, I think what, why that doesn't happen is because essentially they want their stories to be told. And oftentimes they feel that they've been so misrepresented by the tabloid press that they're very grateful to us for wanting to tell the story from their perspective. But no money changes hands and we don't really have a formal contract other than um, what's called a release, which basically means we get them to sign a piece of paper that says, they have read the script um, and we've worked, we've shown them the script, uh, you know, as a work in progress. And also they've seen the film before the public saw it and, and they were happy with it. So, so we don't ask for any sort of life rights or we don't take any copyright or anything like that. Okay. Um, how, in terms of uh, getting a treatment ready, so say for um, uh, five daughters or Oh, I keep on getting all names one that anyway. The, the, the three girls. Laura, we did that on purpose, so we called it three girls because of five daughters to make the link. So it, I get it mixed up all the time. As well. um, the question about what do you take to the commissioner? Is it um, is it first of all a verbal pitch? We're looking into the Rotherham case, or we're looking into the Ipswich murders, and, we, and they go, "Yeah, we're really interested." Given that they're already in the public domain, is that enough to trigger some development money, or are you still expected? to deliver a, um, a treatment, a couple of page treatment? What, what is the process? Um, okay, so, so the process for us, because we're, we're, we're um, working now doing a lot of these things with the BBC. So our last three things have been with the BBC um, and with um, Charlotte, um, who is, uh, you know, amazing. Um, and also with Lucy Richer. So, so those, um, I can talk directly to them now about an idea. Would you be interested in this territory? Because we're really, really keen to research this territory so that I know, because you have to watch that, especially now, that, that uh, because everybody is so hungry to make these stories, that there isn't already five others out there who are doing exactly the same thing, because then you're wasting your time. Um, so whatever commissioner you go to, to ask for that uh, money for the development, um, they will tell you if they've got others going and they'll, they'll also, so it's worth doing that research before you start because these things are so time consuming. Um, once you've done that and you've got an excitement about the territory and often there'll be documentaries already being made about that territory, that's the other thing that you've got to watch. That doesn't need to stop you following through with the drama at all. Um, um, but you just need to be aware that they're out there and because documentaries happen so much quicker than we do. Um, so sometimes that can really help you when you're when you're trying to develop an idea because somebody else has already you know been out there and and, and made it happen for the screen um, but then I kind of you know we kind of need to work out what the story is there's no point in just going would you be interested in doing something about X you know um, if you get that initial yes then you have to go and work out what your story is because lots of true stories they they won't have anything that you can dramatize properly. Um, and you've also got to work out how many parts you're going to do, how, much, how well the story's going to sustain. So you do need to have done a bit of work. Um, so, and that's difficult because that's time consuming with um, uh, money. I mean, not necessarily, you know, for the writer writing a treatment, it's not a huge amount of money, but it is money. And also there's quite a lot of expenses involved with going to meet people and travel expenses and all that kind of thing. So um, for, for us, we're funded by, you know, um, our company, Studio Lambert, to do that. So we're in a really lucky position. If you're on your own, that's harder to do. Um, but often if it's, a, if, you know, now with commissioners, when they know that you have nothing, and but this is a, a, a 
but you have talent and you're really excited and this is a territory they really want to get into and they can only get into through you that's the other thing if you're after something that everybody's after and then you turn up you can guarantee at least 10 other people are going to have you know been and pitched it before you but if it's if it's something that you are uniquely passionate about and they can only get to it from you then they will probably give you an advance to go and do that that development work are you are you um I mean, these are incredibly expensive um, to to make because the lead time in and out is very strong. If you, um, there's a couple of questions that come in. One is obviously if you're losing scenes, you know, significant scenes, are you then literally short of television? How do you make up, you know, you just go, okay, well, this episode is going to be, you know, 57 minutes. We just can't make that up. How do you, you know, if you are cutting five or six minute scenes, you are going to be, potentially short of you know with a drama you just don't have loads of other rushes potentially so how do you cope with that it depends when you have to cut it so um that's why we are really careful to go through the scripts with the contributors before we start shooting because most of the cutting will happen then um, um so we cut at script stage so we make sure we've got you know our scripts are always long because there's always too much <laughs> in there and then they stretch when we're shooting so if it's cut at that time in development, at the script stage before you're shooting, that's a, that's a different thing, because then you make up the time elsewhere. If, um, if as happened with Five Daughters, you have to cut while you're shooting, because one of our contributors didn't want to be involved anymore, um, because of personal reasons, and then we had to take out that whole storyline, um, and we were in the middle of the schedule, then we had to, we had to talk to the commissioners about that. We had to talk to Jay about that. And we had, you know, but the BBC, within there. reason, the BBC. If you if you tell them early enough that that you know you may have to bring the show in a little bit short, they're usually pretty accommodating. I mean, obviously, if it went from fifty nine minutes to forty minutes, they might have an issue. But if it goes from fifty nine to fifty six and a half, sometimes yeah. they can be accommodating of that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Are you? are you still getting decent budgets i mean obviously generally the perception in british television is that we're being asked to do more and more and more on less and less and less and it's much easier to look look towards the streamers um for a you know a nice fat wadge of money um obviously your stories are very domestic and therefore don't resonate as much with with the streamers so do you get enough money is there enough money I think it's. I think that's really complicated now, and and you're asking at exactly the right time, um, because a lot there are so many dramas now based on true stories, but the really heavy hitting stuff, the stuff that we excites us, is very very hard to fund now because. That, but that's because that's twofold. That's because um, the budgets of everything have rocketed. So um, you know what might have been a budget. Of Three, um, three years ago is now a budget of 1.7. So it's, um, that's, that's made a massive difference. And that's why for nearly everything, you're looking for a pre-sale or a co-pro um, uh, or a, a commitment from you know, a big company like all three uh, to deficit fund you. Um, at the moment, the BBC, I, said, I have to tell you, I've been, are amazing about funding but only to a certain level so inevitably our production value um, on these kinds of shows may suffer because we can't we can't put the same amount of money into it as we would for a fiction like something with an s because we can't get that co-pro in at the front because the subject matters are, are too um, difficult so you know, I do worry a little bit about cultural imperialism and all that going forward, <laughs> where uh, we're not allowed to uh, make these shows anymore. But that's something that we discussed with everybody. So far, it's okay, but it, it will be a w real worry in the future about about getting money on the screen. I, I mean, just, you know, from a practical point of view, that the fact of the matter is, you you get on and make them with the money that you've got. You know, and if you're going to quibble. And, and say, well, it's, you know, it's not as much money as they've got on, I don't know, a, 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 some fancy drama with big name actors. You know, you, 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 there's no point in getting out of bed in the morning. 
you you know you 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 work with the budget you've got you work within it and you make it work and you're inventive and that's what you do that's the business we're in yeah absolutely okay can you talk about um let's just finish on the duty of care stuff because you you were saying that you got a tweet um about the nest from from one of the um families from five daughters i can't remember it was, um, it was um the, it was the, the, the mother of, of lisa lynn oh, who, that's who, it, the, the story of the c word that's the character that sheridan smith played in the film her mum tweeted last night saying how much she'd enjoyed the nest yeah yeah we're still in touch with the, the, the thing about the way we work is we are still in touch with quite a few of the people who we've made these programs about now is that an industry standard is that what you do is there any um money put in place for this aftercare for such you know because this isn't six months it's decades 20 years 25 years yeah. it's, it's a lifelong commitment isn't it to to these families so uh just talk a bit about that well um i met uh guy hibbert the writer of no child of mine not that long ago and i asked him because um, I knew he'd been very close to the real girl that that film was made about, and and uh, he and it's when I, I I checked the date on that. I mean, it's something like twenty three years ago. He's still in touch with her, and um, uh, in my own way, that's what I'm doing with the people who with, with uh, on, on three girls. You know, I I, I talk often on the phone. Um, they're all in Manchester, Rochdale. Uh, I I was up in working in Manchester last year, making some, we were making something for Amazon. But, so I saw them often, would you know, go and have a coffee with them or have a meal with them. And uh, I still talk on the phone. So it's not all of them and it's not all of the time, but there are some relationships that will, that, that will go on. And, and some of them are friends. Some of them I feel the need support and I'm happy to do that. Um, and, 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 and there are a couple of friendships that have come out of it as well. So it's a mixture. But, but I'd say that's not an industry standard. Do you know what I mean? That's just because that's what, you know, what we do. we're doing. But, um, but I don't think that... Um, sorry, we're going to get on to that question about permissions, I think, aren't we? And about why, why, how important it is to get the permission and not do yeah, something. Yeah, like OK. Just let, let's, let's kind of broaden it out a bit, because obviously, you know, um, there's, and it's still up there. I just checked yesterday, the Madeleine McCann documentary on Netflix uh, and the Jamie Bulger um, Oscar winning docudrama, which was called uh, Dis um, Detainment. Uh, directed by Vincent Lamb. So they're, they're two um, you know, very high profile series who the Madeleine McCann didn't get Jerry and Kate on board. They didn't approve of it. They said it would hamper any investigation and for them it was an absolute negative. Um, Vincent Lamb didn't approach Jamie Bulger, Bulger's mother, Denise Fergus, at all and didn't even show her, I believe didn't even show her the film before it went out. She only saw it once it'd gone out. And obviously she's campaigning hugely now for a right to privacy, um, that people cannot dramatize your story without your permission. Um, you know, just what do you think about those two cases? I mean, obviously it's not something you would do. Do you think there's any justification ever? I, I think that's really, really difficult to, um, but, First of all, it would be, I don't think that it, uh, having any, anything legal in place would be right. Um, and I think it would um, destroy what a lot of us are doing and, and destroy a lot of what documentary makers are doing as well. Um, morally, I, I think it's wrong, but that's... Also, it begs the question, you know, what, what was it that they wanted to do with the stories? that meant that they didn't feel confident enough to go to the real people and ask their permission. Uh, it's, uh, to my mind, it, it has a bad smell about it. It's kind of using the real story of somebody's life um, because it's already out there in the papers and because it was scandalous and it was a kind of traumatic um, as a way of saying, well, this is like a bit of IP, okay? That I bought this, it's like buying a book or something, do you know what I mean? Or somebody's life story or... Uh, yeah, or somebody's life, and saying, well, now I can do what I like with this, but you haven't paid for it. So if, if you're going to do that, 
um, then I do think it's morally reprehensible myself. And I don't think, I mean, I think sometimes there are things that you might want to do about a case because you're uncovering something that the people that you're talking to don't want you to uncover and that you're, give, you're shining light on something in a, in, you know, in a situation that you couldn't do in any other way. And I think that's different. But I think like particularly with the Jeremy Bulger thing, um, that was so personal to Denise and we, we didn't, but other people I know have tried to do that as a, as a telly before now. And it's been, you know, her trauma is, is, is appalling. And I don't, I haven't seen the film. So I don't know how much more it would give us, whether it was worth causing that trauma to that, uh, to Denise. And I don't think probably that it was. So you're kind of piggybacking on the fame and notoriety that those stories have in order to get yours made, because then there's publicity around it. Without, but it's not a book and it's not a bit of IP, it's somebody's life. So I think that it's um, very tricky ground, morally. Yeah, someone said, I really appreciate your integrity. We need more of this. Oh, that's nice, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's, I think, um, I think it's, it's, it's a tricky one. I, I think, um, you know, there needs to be a kind of, uh, you know, if you can't tell the story, if without, um, if, if, the, if a story centers on a character who hasn't given their permission, how can you tell the story? I mean, it, you, it does, it's, it's such a kind of basic, basic question, isn't it? But it happens a lot in documentary um, that, that people, um feel powerless and perhaps intimidated by the media and you know don't want it to happen but feel powerless to stop it and uh yeah i mean you can see it happening i mean certainly you know also there's a tradition because the the mainstream press does it all the time it just takes people's stories and minute and just you know like the, the five daughters you know it's like you're a prostitute you're this they write all kinds of shit and people feel consistently powerless to change the narrative about their own story yeah, well, yeah. yeah cool. So that, that, that's something that absolutely fires us with every story that we've ever told. Um, that that that's what we that is what drives us. That's what we want to do. Well, first of all, we want to discover things about um, those stories, which is what drives you into it in the first place. And then allowing people to have that voice for the first time, where they where they really are heard and they get their voices on the screen. Um, so Three Daughters was really contentious because those two three families, girls. three girls, see I'm doing it now, <laughs> three girls, uh, was really contentious because the, the families, you know, you can see when you watch it how difficult it was between those girls and the family. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, all of the real uh, women, not girls anymore, um, came to the set um, and they all watched the cut and uh, two of them said, one of them in particular said, until I've seen this, I didn't realize I was a victim. I've never seen myself, I didn't know I was a victim. Oh, my fault. And it's taken all of that time and gone through the whole process of the interviews and everything to sit in front of it and watch it happening and go, that's an actress playing me, and that's what I went through. And oh my God, I was a victim. And it, you know. That was a very shocking day because by then, you know, we'd been working on this one way or another for pro probably more than three years. Yeah. And um, the BBC had insisted uh, that everyone who was featured in the film uh, would sign a release before the film. They'd, they'd agree to show the films, the three episodes. Uh, so uh, we brought them all individually to, to watch it. And, and we got to the end of a three hour watch and, sh and we kind of put the lights up and, and she said, yeah, that's the first time I've ever seen myself as a victim. Aww. It was a very shocking day. Yeah, that's really heartbreaking. Yeah. Heartbreaking. I mean, it's it's almost something kind of wonderful in a way because it did the thing. And that was, that's the, one of the most poignant moments for us. I mean, obviously, you know, when I it won a lot of BAFTAs, it, you know, it did, created lots of debate. But on, that's what we remember as much as any of the rest mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. That's, that's makes that's very emotional i yeah. think that is that is I was, uh, you know i mean that is why you make the films isn't it i mean there's an interesting you know someone has raised an interesting point that that there still is a need for but i think it's about i think it's a moral judgment isn't it because it's like you wouldn't there's a there's certain victims 
you feel like you absolutely need their support to make a story about them. But if they're a bad person, then in a way we go, oh, we don't care about your right to tell your story. We, yeah. You're a bad person. So we don't care whether you give permission or not. We're going to tell your story anyway. I mean, that's, you know, um, so we are making a moral judgment, aren't we? Well, in, yeah. I mean, yes, I mean, certainly uh, in the case of Five Daughters, uh, we didn't seek the permission of the murderer. No. We, we sought the permission of the families, but we didn't seek the permission of the murderer. And we, we portrayed him. I mean, he was, you know, the character was only, sh we showed his arrest. So out of a, again, out of a three hour series, he was probably in it for about two minutes. Uh, but we didn't seek his permission for that. So, yeah, yeah, there are... Uh, and obviously, in uh, Three Girls, we didn't seek the permission of the people who carried out the crimes, you know, the abuse against the girls. Um, and they were um, uh, in prison, uh, mostly. Um, and in the law, you don't need to seek permission from people who are in prison. So morally, you are making that Well, if they, you don't need to seek their permission if they've been convicted of a crime. No. That's interesting. But, and that's the crime you're portraying. Yeah. So you don't, you don't have to seek their permission. Um, so yes, you are making a moral judgment, but in, but in those, in any story or any fiction, you know, whether it's a true story or, or a fiction, you're making those moral judgments all the time. Otherwise you can't tell a story. So you need to be, you know, um, convinced in yourself <laughs> about your position and what you want to say, because if you don't make any moral judgments and if you don't make, take a point of view, then you can't tell a story. Yeah. Um, a couple more things on this that have come in. So one is, um, uh, have you always had this? Um, you, you know, if you, is this something that is part of your DNA, this, this sense of responsibility and, and making these good moral choices? First part of the question. Second part of the question, have you ever fought with a channel going, no, we're not prepared to do that, that you're pushing this story too far? So have they pushed you beyond your, or have you had to fight back against them pushing you beyond your moral compass, moral crossing point? Can't. Um, you know I mean? We've never been, we've never been pushed, I don't think. No, I don't think Into so. doing something. Because usually our stories are so shocking anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's the opposite. <laughs> going, I don't know if we can make this. You know, like when they read Three Girls, they were going, this is this is really difficult, you know, and um, it's going to be really shocking on screen. So nobody has ever made us go further than we've already gone. And the reason that we go that further to start the, that far to start with is because we're talking to those real people and they're telling us our stories, which are often much worse than we can portray on the screen. So, you know, there was an instance, in fact, and 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 we resolved this at the read through where. There was uh, a section in Three Girls uh, about the girls having been kept in a flat for three days uh, by a number of men. I won't go into the detail, but I think you can imagine. Uh, and, and the scene was written and, and, and we read the scene at the read through. Um, and then when we, as you do after a read through, when you sit around and, um, and, and, and everybody gives their notes on, on what they've heard at the read, uh, we jointly agreed that it, that it cumulatively, given everything else that was happening within that episode, that it was just too much. So, so that got cut after a read through. So that can happen. And but, that was a collective choice. But I will say, because you know, you're you're all you're telling a story at the same time. You're making a drama at the same time as telling a true story when you're doing these things. And they've got it's got to work on on both levels. So because we cut that at the read through and. It was really right that we did cut it. When we came to edit it and put it together, there was a hole there. And it took us ages with Philip, <laughs> you know, and the editor to try to work our way around that and, you know, that hole because it had been constructed for that moment, um, you know, uh, to, to hit with such force and it wasn't there. And then we had to construct something else around it. That's the other thing with these, um, you know, because we use quite a lot of archive in them often. So we use quite a lot of real uh, to, kind of pin it to its moment of real news footage and, and um, all of that. So um, 
you know, when you're the editing process is, 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 is you tell the story again, as you do in everything. But with these, with these three stories, it's even more so, you know, even more so. Um, when we were doing Five Daughters and we were, we were already shooting it and, and I had a conversation with Steve and said, you know, Stephen, I think that episode one ends in the wrong place and we're going to have to put a chunk of episode two into episode one. And, went, oh! and then we were rewriting scenes and moving them around and to do that because it's like a living thing you know yeah um uh how do you i mean that how do you cope with bad days so there are must be bad days on set it's very disturbing creating these scenes for the actors and for the crew you take a lot of this home with you and you're a creative partnership as well as a partner partnership how, how do you cope with all with this this the the intimacy of these stories and knowing what you know you know we know 10 percent you know it's like you said most of it we want it's too awful for us to see so how do, how do you deal with that well <laughs> there's, there's no there's no answer to that i did um, i i used to do all i did all the interviews pretty much all the interviews with nicole for three girls and she and I used to travel up and down together on the train to Manchester because we did all we did all the meetings either in Manchester or in Rochdale, which is just up the road. Um, so we would spend a lot of time usually trying to decompress, usually on that train journey home. Uh, often it was with the aid of a of a of a can of gin and tonic from Marks and Spencers in in uh, Manchester Piccadilly train station or, or so, and, and some, but sometimes we would, it would be so late at night, we'd be on the last train and there'd be nothing, there'd be nothing to drink and no food. And we'd just sit there and stare at each other like the only people in the carriage. And, and Nicole did I, something, something we were told, which I won't go into and which we didn't put into the program. Um, uh, we, we were discussing it because we'd never heard it before. It was the first time we'd been told these particular facts. And she looked at me and said, um, I wish I could unknow that. Yeah. And um, there's, there's come no answer, really. A lot of gin and tonic is the, is the best answer, I think. And, you know, there were other things that happened. There were times when contributors had a wobble somewhere in the middle for one reason or another. Or some other, some maybe another family member spoke to them and said to them, why are you doing, you shouldn't be doing this or something. And then they'd come on to me and say, I've been thinking. You know, and then, you know, I'd have to talk to them and listen and try just work it out with them how they felt. And then the last thing I could do would be ever to go and report that to Philippa, maybe on the set, who was directing or, you know, or, and certainly never let that near the actors. You just, it's, um, you, you, you have to absorb it. I, I don't, there's no better answer, actually. We shouted each other quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, Sometimes it gets a bit hysterical around here and then we kind of go, because it's within these four walls, we can all get a bit hysterical and then, you know, we can let it go because, you know, uh, we don't let it go, but you know, you know what I mean. It, 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 the thing is when you're making them, there's so many things coming at you from so many different directions because there's the legals that you've got to, you know, sort, sort out. There's, there's the, the program itself and selling it like you have to sell any program and getting it to the screen, making it as good as you possibly can dealing with the, you know, with the contributors, all the creative things that you've got to deal with as well. So it's really, I think the worst time is when you're waiting for it to go out, because especially with something like Three Girls, because we didn't know what the reaction was going to be. And it could have been, you know, it could have been very tough what we got. And so, um, and we were so worried about the families and the girls. So we had to keep moving them around the place to get away from the press because we were so worried about the press. So um, getting hold of them, you know, so um, I'm blowing who they were and everything. So it's, it's like, it's like you're so in it that the pressures that come at you and the decisions you have to make constantly, every day, every day, every day, you, you don't have time to overthink or over worry about all of that. It's afterwards, once it's happened, then you, you have more time to process that. But that's like anybody who deals yeah with these stories, isn't it? You know, you have to find a way to process it. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about casting because um, how do you, how did you cast, let's, three girls, for example, how did you cast 
those they were fantastic and how did you help them through because they they must have found it troubling some of those scenes are very disturbing yeah do you want to talk um, about that yeah, uh, uh three girls was cast by shaheen Beg, um who who is a friend of ours and we've worked with quite a lot um she also cast five daughters she's particularly brilliant at um casting um young people um she's just she's very skilled at what she does but also it is um there is no um getting away from the fact that you 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 just have to meet a lot of people so uh, particularly when you're casting young people, the only way to do it is to, is, is, is to meet a lot. And that's what we did. Um, F Philippa and I, um, again, in Manchester, because we, we tried to find as many of them as local to Rochdale as we could, uh, travelled up there and we did the sessions in Manchester. Um, and we did, we did some in London as well, but, but mostly in Manchester. And they were long sessions. You know, we probably spent four or five days meeting young people um, and each day that probably meant meeting I don't know 20 or 30 people in a day um, and that's after Shaheen has already been through and filtered quite a few out so she's already showing us people who she thinks have have some talent and some skill and we're still then still trying to find our, our three. Um, of those three obviously uh, uh, Ria Zimitrovic, um was already a well-established actress and was much older. I mean, she looks terribly young, but I think at the time, I think she was about 26 when we made that, but, okay. but still play 18, you know. Um, so she was established. The other two really uh, were, uh, were not. Um, and uh, then the other part of that is that, is that, is that Philippa is a really, really good director and is very, very good, again, at working with young people. She's, she really, you know, she's very intense, very um, respectful, um, very careful, um, and very precise. I mean, Ria, on, on the, on the, on the read-through, um, because some of the real people were there, you know, and, and Ria felt, because she was older, I think, the enormity of the responsibility of it and it was nearly too much actually for her i mean at that moment it was she found it really difficult and um because she was question just come in actually do you offer any counseling to the cast which which goes with what you're talking uh, about not no because we had we had a responsibility to the to those under the did, age of yeah. 16 and we they we we did psychological profiling yes yeah. we, we did and and um that's required uh and we they yeah we before we were able to offer them the jobs they had to undergo psychological profiling and uh, and we acted upon the advice that came back from the psychologist in terms of how we then uh cared for them through the filming but but it's, it's also just worth saying philippa is a terrific director so she was so caring and so inclusive and loving that I don't think they ever felt the strain of what they were doing. I may and, be and wrong. Also, and also because Philippa, you know, is um, cause of doing documentaries as well. So she, her eye for the truth, you know, for the, tr for, for the, the performance and the truth of the performance, you know, she'll just very gently go again and go again and go again until she gets what she wants and she draws it from them. And it's such a nurturing kind of, um, uh, the set, you know, between Simon and, and Philippa is so nurturing that that they feel safe to go to places that normally they wouldn't. Um, and uh, yeah, so that so that also has a special place. I mean, I have to say with the nest, um, you know, um, because we just worked with Mary Mack and that's her first job out of college. Um, and, um, you know, she was giving a fantastic performance. So it's about spotting the talent and then seeing how truthful it is and then you know, with a director like Philippa, literally kind of drawing it from them, you know, making them feel safe. Um, finally, let's get to uh, what's next. We're, we've got a couple of minutes left. What's, um, I think everyone really enjoyed The Nest. So, so what are you working on next? What can we look forward to? Um, we're doing another show with Nicole, but it's, it's like under wraps <laughs> because it's so early, it's such early days. Um, um, true stories, I mean, 
Nick, the nest was was based on an awful lot of research, but it's not a true story because having done two, um, uh, the C word and um, and three girls, is because she really wanted to have the freedom because it can be quite restricting doing those true stories as well. But you have to stick to the timeline. You've got to stick to that truth. You know, you've got to make it all work within that framework. And she really wanted the freedom to flex different muscles, different writing muscles, you know, and write a thriller and, you know, do it uh, differently. Um, so we've, we've got another project with her. Um, and then we, we're not, I mean, we were stalled from making something, which we will make, but again, I can't really talk about that, which is another true story, um, which we'll make as soon as the lockdown lifts. And then we're, you know, trying to sell as ever lots of other ideas and lots of other stories, some adaptations of books and, and, uh, Lots of other things that we're excited about, but um, there's nothing I can pluck out and say this is what we're going to do next. <laughs> uh, and this is kind of the same for you, isn't it? Really. Mm. Um, I'm going to go off and, and work with um, another producer who I admire a lot on, on another factual story. Um, but I'm not sure I can talk about it actually. I'm not exactly. So you're not like somewhere anyway. I'm not sure they've announced it. So, exactly, um, they haven't. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but as soon as uh, they 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 want to make that, as soon as the lockdown uh, is lifted, so uh, we're just sort of uh, uh, quizzing each other, going, "Well, when do you think it'll be? Yeah, when will it be? When will it be? When will we be able to meet again? <laughs> Thank you both so so much. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much for all the time you've put into this as well. You've been brilliant, really brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining. Take care. Bye.